Jeremiah chapter 8 introduction This chapter has many metaphors that symbolizes the approach of the Chaldean invasion and the hopelessness of any deliverance of the Judahites All opportunities for repentance and return to God have been spurned and the nation is rushing headlong into destruction Divisions of the chapter are as follows 1 The invaders desecrate the graves verses 1 to 3 Two, Israel stubbornly continues in idolatry. Verses four to seven. Three, God describes the penalty of their apostasy. Verses eight to thirteen. Four, the invaders approach. Verses fourteen to seventeen. Five, the sorrow of the prophet is recorded. Verses eighteen to twenty-two. The graves desecrated. Verses one to three. Verse one. At that time, say the Lord. They shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. This denotes the utter desolation of the city, not only rasing the walls but turning up the very sepulchers which were deemed sacred by the Jews. Usually, graves were desecrated by the enemies for two reasons: one. to show their anger and ferociousness two to show their greed and expectation of finding concealed treasures josephus a jewish priest scholar and historian tells us that solomon buried david with great wealth and 1300 years afterward hyrcanus the high priest when besieged by antiochus opened one of the rooms of david's sepulcher and took out 3000 talents of gold with which he bribed antiochus to lift the siege but this anger on the jews was from the avenging justice of god even the grave was not a safe and secret place from god's vengeance it spared none of any degree or quality Verse two gives the fivefold engagement of the Jews with the host of heaven in their one loving them, two serving them, three walking after them, four seeking them, and five worshiping them. Here, the prophet describes idolatrous worship in the five stages of its development, and then contrasts its fullness with the miserable reward which follows. The bones were spread before the sun the moon and all the host of heaven that they loved the prophet introduces these astral powers as unconcerned spectators of god's vengeance that were utterly helpless to afford any protection or assistance to the suffering jews the sight shall be so shameful as if one should draw forth the adulteress with the adulterer into open view and expose them together Verse 3 describes unexpressibleness of their misery. Not only were the dead desecrated, the scattered remnant who survived the invasion also shall exercise the same misery. It would be a terrible time. Nobody would want to remain alive. Israel stubbornly continues in idolatry. Verses 4 to 7. Here the prophet sets forth the obstinacy of the people in wickedness. and the fearfulness of their judgment the argument in verse 4 and 5 is that when men fall they do not lie upon the ground but endeavor to get up again and when a man loses his way he does not persist in going on but turns around and retraces his steps as soon as man is sensible of his mistake he returns back this is usually done among men but Israel instead of following the dictates of common sense and natural instinct held fast to their deceitful idolatry and refused to rise and return to God they showed no desire to repent and return they are slidden back by a perpetual backsliding verse 6 says they are full of hypocrisy and everyone follows his own fantasy without any consideration The unbridledness of their lust and the persistence of the people in sin are compared to the fury that seizes the war horse at the sound of the trumpet. On hearing the sound, the horse rushes into the battle and nothing can stop it in its destructive course. Judah likewise is swift to commit sin, paying no attention to the danger and death by it. They showed no tendency to repentance. 
verse 7 yeah the stalk in the heaven knoweth her appointed times and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming but my people know not the judgment of the lord jeremiah turned aside to the migratory birds and accuses judah for being ignorant of god's judgments these migratory birds know the appointed seasons to discern when to change homes the stock returns to their home residence for summer after spending their winter in their migratory residence whereas the turtle crane and swallow returns home for winter after spending their summer in the migratory residence but my people know not the judgment of the lord israel seem to know nothing of the times and seasons god appointed for them they know not whether his summer of grace is offered or his winter of punishment is threatened so as to embrace the one and prevent the other the stupidity of god's people could not be matched even with the birds god describes the penalty of their apostasy verses 8 9 though the jews were ignorant of the judgment of the lord and were more stupid than the stork turtle crane and swallow yet they boasted continually that the law of the lord is with them in verse 8 the prophet says that god need not have given them the law because the lying pen of the scribes have made the law a lie corruption was so universal that even the law was falsely interpreted and written by the scribes as to become a lie the scribes perverted the ways of god and made void the lord's commandments The Jews boasted in the knowledge of these falsely interpreted law. The word of the Lord is the true source of wisdom. Psalms 119:98 to 100, Proverbs 1:7 and Proverbs 9:10 to 12. Verse 9 says that since the wise scribes rejected the word of the Lord by falsely interpreting the law according to the needs of the people, they would be ashamed of the wisdom with which they boasted when calamities come upon them. their wisdom would appear to be folly and unprofitable to them the beginning of the lord's punishment verses 10 to 13 verse 10 to 12 repeat what jeremiah had said in jeremiah 6 12 to 15 covetousness and false dealing prevailed in all ranks of leadership which was the cause of the ruin of the spiritual leaders they rejected god's word and persisted in their deceit by mentioning the word peace twice in verse 11 the prophet shows how the false prophets have deceived the people not only once but proceeded obstinately in the work of deceiving the wretched people by their false promises after committing all abominations the false prophets were not at all ashamed which is a proof of a wickedness past all remedy So the Lord said that he would give their wives and fields to the newly coming invaders and would cause them to fall along with the rest in the coming invasion. The failure of all crops and agricultural benefits and the sterility of the lands were common metaphors in the Old Testament used to express God's judgment upon sinful people. Israel will soon be consumed by the Lord and it would become a degenerate vine and a barren fig tree. We find an echo of the teaching of Jeremiah in that of Jesus, Matthew twenty one nineteen and Luke thirteen six to nine. In Micah seven one, we have another example of the same figurative language. God threatens the Jews that He Himself would soon become their avenger and that they would be deprived of the fruits of the earth. The approach of the invaders, verses fourteen to seventeen. Verse fourteen. Why do we sit still? assemble yourselves and let us enter into the defense cities and let us be silent there for the lord our god hath put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the lord when no good came and when only troubles came instead of the promised peace healing and health the people at last recognized that they were betrayed by the false prophets they were convicted in their consciousness of their sins They acknowledged that it is God's hand that was against them. They were grievously frightened upon the coming of the Babylonians. They have decided to flee to the defense cities, realizing that all hope is lost and thinking perhaps to survive a little longer there. 
But even there, they expect only to be put to silence, a euphemism for put to death. They understood that the woeful experience was from God. Jeremiah compared their judgment to being given a water of gall to drink. This poisonous herb is called succum circute, the juice of hemlock. After pursuing the Egyptians in the battle of Carchemish, Nebuchadnezzar entered Israel through Dan in the north of Israel. Verse 16 The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. The snorting of their horses was a noise the horses make through their nostrils. It seems to be a hyperbolic expression showing the certainty of the coming of the Babylonian monarch and his army to invade Judea and besiege Jerusalem. His cavalry would be before the infantry. So terrible was the united neighing of the cavalry of the Babylonians that the reverberation of the air caused the whole ground to tremble. The horses have devoured the land and all that is in it. It is spoken in a prophetical style which expresses the certainty of what it shall be as if it actually were already. In verse 17, Jeremiah increases the terror by another comparison of the invading Babylonians to serpents and cockatrices which were noxious and hurtful creatures which cannot be charmed and whose venomous bite is fatal. Serpent charmers in the east entice serpents by music and by a particular pressure on the neck to render them incapable of darting. Psalm 58.4, Psalm 58.5 The cockatrice is supposedly a serpent produced from a cock's egg. A mythical animal depicted as a two-legged dragon with a cock's head. The cockatrice looks with proud disdain upon the traps and snares and will not be charmed. It means that this Chaldeans would wage a pitiless war and not be diverted from their purposes in destroying the Jews by any techniques or methods whatsoever. Jeremiah is very sad about Jerusalem, verses 18-22. to these verses give the lamentation of the prophet for the impending calamity of his country and the great mental pain that he felt. The prospect of this catastrophic invasion filled Jeremiah with sorrow and his heart was faint in him. He could not get over his sorrow. In verse 19, Jeremiah affectionately calls the daughter of his people whose cry was loud as they lamented their case before the Lord because the Chaldeans who came from far country. The people complain, Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? They accused God of falsehood as though he had deceived them since he had promised to be the defender of their city and of the whole land. Lord answers them by giving idolatry as the reason for their suffering. Verse 20 The harvest is past, the summer is ended and we are not saved. This verse tells of the people besieged in Jerusalem complaining on account of the length of the siege. The harvest from April to June is the time of the ingathering of the grain. The summer from July to August is the time of the ingathering of the fruits. Since the grain has failed and the fruit gathering has also proved unproductive, there was a serious lack of food. The Lord had left them exposed to judgment as grain left standing after the harvest. All hopes were gone, despair seized the people and there was no way to escape from the situation. The people looked for help that summer at the earliest. They flattered themselves with a speedy deliverance since the false prophets amused them with their vain hopes of deliverance. The siege of Jerusalem lasted two years for Nebuchadnezzar came against it in the ninth year of Zedekiah and the city was taken in the eleventh year. See 2 Kings 25 1-3 the false prophets during all that time continued to seduce the people by their frivolous promises. So the people expected deliverance the first year. None came. They hoped for it the second year. They were disappointed. There was no appearance of escape or deliverance. In verse 21, 
the prophet deeply sympathized with the people and he identifies himself with his people in their humiliation the weeping prophet is broken in heart he is black with grief and sorrow astonishment had taken hold of him at the miseries that were upon his people when no remedy was there for them the language here is highly emotional with short nervous sentences marking the warm feeling of the writer as cannot be expressed by lengthy sentences verse 22 is there no balm in gilead is there no physician there why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered the prophet intimates in these words that the slaughter of the people would be so fatal that they would in vain seek remedies balm Pistachia lentiscus is a medicinal aromatic herb grown in Gilead which is in the south of the Sea of Galilee and is noted for its saving and healing properties. Genesis 37:25. Judah's priests and prophets were the physicians. The people's sorrow was immedicable and the physicians failed to apply balm on the people in their distress. Their disease was desperate and incurable. Balm could heal a physical injury but the health of Judah's spirit would not improve if they did not return to the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 8 questions Jeremiah chapter 8 answers 